Great. Well, good morning. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone today. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm the Senior Director of Program and Growth here at the Cancer Support Community Arizona. And uh, today we are talking with Dr. Trout. Dr. Trout, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. So today um, at the Cancer Support Committee, we're um, having a conversation about cannabis and cancer. And so Dr. Trout, would you mind just kind of sharing a little bit about um, who you are in your role um, and um, what you do there? Sure. Again, uh, my name is Dr. Trout. I'm a naturopathic physician and I am the medical director of medical education for harvest dispensaries. Great. And as far as role, my main role there is to provide education for the staff at the dispensaries, mm -hmm. education about cannabis, medical cannabis, and again, other medical education, how to interact with patients. I also provide medical education and education materials for patients that come into the dispensaries, and we do um, new patient orientations and have different forums to, again, provide patients the information they need to, to get the best benefit out of this medicine. Wonderful. So tell me a little bit about your patient education that you provide. Do you, do you provide just kind of a general overview about cannabis um, and how it might be utilized? Is it something you do, anything specific um, related to oncology, anything around that? Yeah, we do. Um, it, each dispensary, specifically at the Harvest of Tempe, we do the second Saturday of the month at uh, 11 a.m. And at the Harvest of Scottsdale, we do the fourth Saturday of the month at 11 a.m. And we're also getting down to Tucson. And as we expand, we're, we're figuring out how to, how to get all that information out there. But um, just general information. We spend about an hour, hour and a half covering the, the basics, the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. And then we, we let patients ask questions and, and we kind of uh, steer that information towards who shows up that day. Uh, I'm getting to where I can teach a college course on the subject and you know trying to get it all out in an hour and a half can can be tough but um, yeah so basic information we cover mm -hmm. and then any other questions that, that people have. Terrific and so do you have to have your um, I guess medical marijuana card in order to be able to hear some of that education is it I don't know what the regulations are around that can you enter the dispensary or how does that work? Yeah, so Harvest has set up um, a suite or an education classroom, if you will, next to the dispensary. Um, so it does allow anybody from the community, whether or not they have a medical cannabis card or not, to come out and, and get information. Okay. Um, and a lot of people will use that as a resource when they're just considering whether they want to get yeah. a card or use medical cannabis and they just want to get some more information before they they dive into it. Oh terrific. I think that's a great point because we have a lot of people here who are unsure as to whether or not you know it would be a useful tool for them or not and we know those cards can be a little bit expensive and obviously when dealing with cancer there are a lot of um, expenses that people have and so I've often heard people who are a little bit hesitant um, you know, I don't know if I should get one because what if it doesn't work? And so that sounds like it could be a good opportunity. What would you suggest for other things that people might consider if they're not sure? Um, yeah, obviously that's, that's a tough one. And, and we, like I said, we try to bridge that gap by mm -hmm. providing that forum where um, before patients totally jump into it, they can, they can come out sure. and get the information they're looking for. Okay. So, um, kind of specifically getting into the world of, of cancer and kind of how cannabis might help support cancer. You know, one of the questions that comes up sometimes is, um, you know, what's the difference between CBD and THC and people talk about, you know, CBD oil and, you know, can you share a little bit about that piece? Um, sure. Um, the cannabis, so this is a very complex plant. There's up to 400 plus different constituents that wow. we've isolated from it and some very special ones that we call cannabinoids. Okay. We named them after the plant because they are found so abundantly and so uniquely in, in just this plant. Huh. Um, of these cannabinoids, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is the main one that we talk about. Uh, the reason is it's the most abundant cannabinoid that mm -hmm. we find in the plant, but it's also the main one that causes that psychoactive effect or that okay. euphoria okay. or what people refer to as, as being high. Um, so it gets the most attention. Um, CBD cannabidiol is the second most abundant cannabinoid that we find in the cannabis plant and it is non or, or non euphoric might be a better way to, to describe that. Um, so it doesn't cause those um, again the euphoria the, the come with products. 
Um, with that being said, still very medicinal. Um, it's known to be a great anti-inflammatory agent, mm -hmm. cannabidiol. It's mm -hmm. known to be a great antioxidant. It's also been shown to be a good neuroprotectant or actually helps to protect uh, brain cells. Um, and then we're seeing with a lot of other preclinical studies that it has effects on uh, blood sugar issues, oh. um, potentially cardioprotective, mm -hmm. and again, it works on a lot of different pathways in our, in our body. We're just kind of understanding the, the tip of the iceberg of yeah. that. And I think of CBD and cannabidiol, these non-psychoactive cannabinoids, more like nutritional supplementation, something you do on a daily basis for those anti-inflammatory, antioxidant mm -hmm. type of effects. I think of the THC part of the medicine, mm -hmm. more for, again, that psychoactive kind of relief of symptoms, okay. um, just to help people manage different symptoms. And, and like I said, um, really provides them, like relief is probably the best way to, yeah. to describe it. In fact, many of my patients will say, you know, I totally, that are dealing with very severe pain, will mm -hmm. say, I don't even experience it like a high. Mm -hmm. I just experience it like, again, relief of those okay. symptoms. So kind of that right here and right now, effect. But there's up to a hundred of these cannabinoids. I could go on, on and on <laughs> talking about it. And, and we think that they all work together, all of these cannabinoids okay. and the terpenoids and the flavonoids, the whole plant medicine. Sure. So I think a lot of times when people think about, you know, marijuana, cannabis in general, they think about, you know, smoking it. And obviously that's a concern for people who've been diagnosed with cancer and, sure. you know, just in general for people to think about, gosh, I don't want to hurt my lungs any more than, you know, that. Can you tell us about how you might, um, you know, what forms does it come in and how might it be utilized and what, do we, what are our options there? Sure, um, and there's a lot of different forms that medicine comes in and you don't have to smoke it to, mm -hmm. to get the effects of cannabis. Um, the fact that you can inhale cannabis though definitely has its place. Okay. Um, when you inhale the medicine, it kicks in in like two to five minutes. So mm. instant effects, instant relief. Especially people that are dealing with nausea, vomiting, those types of okay. issues. Again, to be able to inhale that medicine, have it kick in immediately, mm -hmm. not have to go through the GI tract and take, you know, a good 30 minutes to an hour before it kicks in can be quite profound for, for many individuals. Right. Um, and we also have other products like vaporizers where you don't actually have to combust it. You can just heat it up and, and inhale the vapors. So less potential for carcinogens and other types of, of chemicals that are created with combustion that can have harmful effects. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, there's still people that, that um, don't want to inhale it mm -hmm. and, and have different lung conditions, which you know, they should probably steer away from inhaling mm -hmm. cannabis. Um, it can be eaten in the form of many different medicines. Uh, tincture medicines, which are like liquid extracts. Mm -hmm. um, that's the form that botanical medicines have been in for, for thousands of mm -hmm. years. Um, it's also these tinctures are very standardized as well and can be dosed out drop by drop or dropper oh. full. Um, so I think that's a great way to use the medicine. You can also hold tinctures under the tongue and get some sublingual mm -hmm. absorption. So maybe it kicks in in 20 to 30 minutes in that full hour with, with most other edible mm -hmm. type products. Um, we're seeing capsules come to the market mm -hmm. as well, which are again, much more standardized. Um, don't have the, the cannabis taste that, that yeah. comes along with, mm -hmm. with some of those products. Um, of course, there's the, the edible products where the cannabis oil is mixed into um, other foods. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta be a little careful with some of those because like the cookies and brownies are loaded with sugar, mm -hmm. which is inflammatory, sure. right? Can exacerbate a lot of the medical yeah. conditions that, that people are dealing with. Um, but those edibles, quite convenient as well. The, the lozenges and those types of things are real nice because you can kind of hold them against the mm -hmm. cheek and get some of that mucosal absorption as well. And you can put them in a pocket or a purse so they're real convenient mm -hmm. to, to carry around. Um, but boy, the, the products are getting going on and on. We're also seeing transdermal patches come into market, wow. um, salves and balms that work just where you put them. They don't have those systemic type of effects. Um, inhalers as well, kind of mm -hmm. like an albuterol inhaler, except mm -hmm. that as cannabis dose. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of different forms that you can get this yeah, medicine in. Sounds like it. So it sounds like depending on the form that you use, um, you also have to think about the effect of the, the product, right? So uh, absolutely. It, what I heard was if you were ingesting something, could take up to an hour. Right. So, you know, one of the things I think um, I've certainly heard people talk about is, you know, trying some of those edibles and feeling like they may be overdosed on that. How, what would you suggest if somebody's kind of brand new, not sure 
to do um, if they were to ingest something because they didn't want to inhale or they weren't sure about that part of it. Um, sure. What do you suggest for that? Yeah, so different modes of administration, like you said, will have different onsets. Mm -hmm. They're experienced in a little bit different way. And that's another nice thing about inhalation is that it kicks in so quickly that it's a little more predictable. It gives people kind of instant feedback mm -hmm. on that dose. Mm -hmm. um, so they can just kind of yeah. take a go, ooh, well, I've had enough. And yeah. they can set it aside and okay. it titrated a pretty decent dose for them. And then we'll wear off in about two to four hours. Okay. Um, with eating it, not kicking in for a half an hour to an hour, it provides people an opportunity to put too much mm -hmm. into the system more than mm -hmm. may become comfortable for them. Um, so you got to be a bit more conservative when you're dosing with those edible type products. Mm -hmm. And you also have to take the manufacturer's word for the potency. Um, mm -hmm. There's a great, great variability in, in the potency or the amount of, of THC that may be in those different products. So mm -hmm. again, good education is, is very important before people just kind of dive in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very safe medicine from a toxicity perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, in the 5,000 year written history of medical cannabis use that we do have, mm -hmm. we don't have one confirmed case of somebody having a lethal overdose. Mm -hmm. um, it's not known to cause liver toxicity or toxicity to the kidneys either, so mm -hmm. very safe. Mm -hmm. However, those psychoactive effects are quite powerful. Sure. And if you get too much in the system, it does not feel good. Yeah. Um, it can cause, again, the heart to race, anxieties, paranoia. Um, so yeah, dosing is very, very important and, and having that good education um, helps. So if I'm a brand new patient and I just got my card and I go to a dispensary, like what is that process? How does that, what does that look like? How do, I, how do I find out? You know, it sounds like there's so many different options, which could probably be pretty overwhelming if sure. I'm new to this. How do you work with a new patient that might walk in the door? Yeah, that's one of the, and, and you said it, uh, I hear that from patients all the time. They come in, they see all the different strain names of the different types of cannabis and all the different products, and um, it can be a little overwhelming. In a perfect world, it would be the physician that was prescribing or recommending, in this case, uh, the cannabis to the patient would tell them, um, this is the product you should take, this is how much you should take. Uh, they'd have them come back in a couple of weeks and follow up on them, mm -hmm. with them, just to make sure that um, they're getting the effects that they should be, mm -hmm. no side effects, that type of thing. Um, if it isn't working the way it should, they'd change the dosing for them. And that's just not really taking place in the cannabis world. Yeah. Um, because again, the, the politics, it's still schedule one on a federal level. Not many mm -hmm. physicians are wanting to you know, work into managing the dosing. So at Harvest, we try to bridge that gap by providing these new education, mm -hmm. um, uh, new patient orientations where they can come in and, and learn more about the medicine, mm -hmm. ask questions, um, kind of take some of that confusion away about all the different yeah. products, how they're used. Um, and that's basically what it looks like. Again, the staff is very well trained about the cannabis and the different types of products that are in the dispensary. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can provide patients that education. Um, I think it's also important for the patients to realize though that the staff is not their treating physician. Right. So they can't tell patients exactly what to take. Right. Um, so again, their role is just to provide very good education on those products to, to help patients yeah. make those decisions. Yeah, it sounds like there's still some work to be done to try to figure out how we can really help coordinate some of that care. But until that happens, it sounds like your role is to really make sure that the staff that are available when a patient walks in the door. Correct. Um, so that they can at least educate them about the product. Absolutely. Sounds like. Okay. And then, like I said, we provide um, patient support groups and the new patient education um, to where if they don't feel like they're getting everything they need. And it's a process. It's not um, yeah. a one size fits all. So again, we are there along that process to help answer those questions as they arise. Okay. Um, it looks like we have a question that's kind of come in off our um, Facebook. Wonderful. Um, so is there an opportunity to purchase any of the products that you mentioned without a medical card? I actually heard this question before especially with like the CBD, maybe not with the THC yeah. pieces. Is that something that you can do? Um, there's a lot of CBD products available out there without a card. Um, I've seen CBD products in other doctor's offices. I've seen them at health food stores. Um, there's places online that you can purchase those CBD mm -hmm. products. Um, many dispensaries will offer um, specific CBD products that 
does not have the THC associated mm -hmm. with it uh, without a card as well. So, um, yeah, absolutely. The, and those so could I available. just walk into a dispensary if I don't have a card? and specifically look for the CBD products. Is that a possibility um, there, or again, there are how does that work? There are dispensaries that in the lobby, you can okay. go in and they'll have uh, CBD products available okay. that, that patients can get without a card or any individual can get without yeah. a card. And how do you get a medical marijuana card? How does that work? Mm -hmm. So here in the state of Arizona, you have to get a certification from a that mm -hmm. certifies that you have one of the qualifying conditions. Okay. Um, cancer is obviously a qualifying condition for the program in Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, in a perfect world, the patient's primary care physician or their specialist, their oncologist, would actually write that certification for them. Mm -hmm. um, but many uh, conventional physicians don't, or still don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. writing that certification. I think they may still have some fears about, again, federal law, or many of them say that they're just not familiar enough yeah. with cannabis. Sure. Um, and again, I know that for many conventional physicians, botanical medicine isn't necessarily in their scope of practice. So mm -hmm. I understand if, if they don't feel comfortable signing mm -hmm. those, but um, they definitely have the, the right to sign those in Arizona. And I think, like I said, in a perfect world, yeah, their primary care physician that they already see would, yeah. would sign that for them. Then they wouldn't have to pay an extra you know, fee out of pocket. It could be done right during their, their regular visit. Um, but since most won't, there are these certain centers that have popped out up mm -hmm. throughout the state and their main job is to certify patients and, and help them get through the process. Uh, so what they need to do is they need to make an appointment at one of these certification centers and they'll walk them through the steps but uh, you have to get medical records from one of your treating physicians from within the last 12 months okay. that show the qualifying condition and you bring those or have them faxed over to the certification center. Um, the physician will do uh, have to do some physical exams, look at the medical records, and if that physician believes the patient qualifies for the program, they'll sign the certification for mm -hmm. them. And then the patient needs to do an online application with the health department and pay the application fees. Um, and if someone's computer savvy, they can do it pretty easily if they've got a scanner um, within an hour or so. If they don't feel comfortable doing that, most of the certification have another service that they provide that mm -hmm. they'll take the photograph, upload everything onto the internet and do that online application with the health department for them. Okay. And then after that it shows up in the mail in about one to three weeks and that allows the patient to go to any of the state licensed dispensaries okay. in the state of Arizona to get medicine. And so then how long is that card good for? That card is good for one year so okay. they have to go through that process So they annually. would have to go back to that recertification or another certification center. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess one of the other questions that kind of pops in my mind when you talk a little bit about that is, so we're talking with cancer patients specifically or kind of who we're working with, what kinds of, uh, what, what reasons might somebody, we know that cancer is one of the qualifying conditions, what might cannabis help with for a cancer patient? Sure. What kinds of things could it support? Well, traditionally individuals dealing with cancer have used cannabis to help palliate symptoms help them feel better, um, help with nausea and vomiting that can come with okay. especially the side effects of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, cannabis has known, been known for a long time to, to help soothe those symptoms. And in fact, many oncologists have been recommending cannabis to their patients going through chemotherapy mm -hmm. for decades just on the hush hush mm -hmm. because of the politics that, mm -hmm. that go along with it. Um, help stimulate appetite, help with pain, mm -hmm. help with sleep for that overall sense of, of well-being that, that mm -hmm. cannabis can, can provide for many individuals. Um, uh, muscle pain, spasticity, again, just, just to help them feel yeah. better, basically. That's traditionally how, how cannabis has been used. Okay. Um, I do have a question, too. I, I know that some physicians prescribe, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but essentially sort of a synthetic uh, marijuana or synthetic cannabis. What's the difference between what they're, you know, so when you talk about many physicians have known sure. about these properties, they can't prescribe a cannabis without being, you know, part of that group. What's the difference between what they're prescribing for sure. patients and, and what you're off, what, what medical marijuana is? Yeah, so pharmaceutical THC okay. um, has been available in the United States since the 80s. 
by prescription. Mm -hmm. uh, dronabinol is the, the generic name mm -hmm. of it. Um, Marinol mm -hmm. is um, one of the trade names mm -hmm. for, for that pharmaceutical product. And it is specifically indicated for, um, again, the nausea, vomiting mm -hmm. that can come with, with chemotherapy, uh, pain associated with cancer as well. Um, and, and like I said, yeah, it, it, patients have been able to get it since the 80s. Um, but it is just THC, synthetic oh, okay. THC. And I think that this point probably goes further than anything to drive home the fact that it is not just THC that's providing the medical benefit mm. from this plant medicine. It's the THC, it's the cannabidiol, it's all the other hundred cannabinoids working together, the terpenoids, the whole plant mm -hmm. medicine. Um, but yeah, um, still to this day, patients can get a prescription from their physician for a synthetic mm -hmm. uh, THC, pharmaceutical THC. Okay. And it sounds like there's, there are lots of different options then when it comes to this, that people could really get some benefits from certain things, but perhaps not getting full benefit if they're getting that prescription because it's not including some of the other properties of the plant that help. Correct. Got it. Um, and remember, the THC is the psychoactive part Correct. of the medicine. And so then do people experience those psychoactive properties with that synthetic product that's prescribed? A absolutely, okay. um, especially in the higher dosing of it. And, sure. and that's what um, many people's are complaint is with mm. that product, as they say. Um, and, and the psychoactive effect can just, it's real strong. It doesn't have that overall sense of well-being that comes with the, the whole plant yeah. medicine. So um, those other cannabinoids and other compounds really have a way of, of balancing out that psychoactive of effect and giving, giving it more of that, um, again, that, that sense of well-being that, that comes along with it. Sure, sure. So you talked a little bit about nausea as a big place um, that people some relief or support. Um, tell me a little bit about other, uh, I'm thinking specifically things like people often have issues with sleep, um, pain management, sure. some of those pieces. Can you dive a little into some of those areas as well? Yeah, well, pain management is, is obviously the big one and, and a big topic right mm -hmm. now because people are looking for an alternative to what uh, conventional medicine provides for right. pain. Right. Um, you know, as everybody's starting to, to find out, we're, we're starting to have the dialogue now in the media about um, the problems with these opiate pain medicines, yeah. um, the crisis that we're seeing with, with lethal overdose mm -hmm. with, with many of these pain med medicines. So again, people are, are looking for an alternative to that. Mm -hmm. About 90% of the card holders in Arizona do have their card for severe and chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And they're reporting wonderful results with it. Mm -hmm. They're reporting being able to use less of those types of pharmaceuticals that come mm -hmm. with, with many side effects mm -hmm. as well. Um, that they're, they're, a, they're just seeing a much better quality of life mm -hmm. with, with cannabis as an alternative or as an, an adjunct mm -hmm. to those. And, and like I said, many people are, are getting off of, of those opiate pain medicines altogether and, and mm -hmm. using cannabis as an alternative. Um, we're seeing some great studies bearing that out as well. Um, 2014, the Journal of American Medical Association published a study showing that states that have medical cannabis laws, we've seen a 25% decrease in lethal overdose mm -hmm. on these opiate medicines. Um, that's huge. And yeah. um, there's just a couple studies that were published um, here in April 2018 showing that the states that have medical cannabis laws, uh, they're seeing a decrease in the prescribing of these mm -hmm. opiate mm -hmm. pain medicine. So um, we take that as um, information that this cannabis is working mm -hmm. for, for these patients and they're able to get by with less of, of those pharmaceuticals. Great. And what about sleep? A lot of people yeah, have struggle sure. with sleep um, for a variety of reasons when in treatment, obviously one of them can cause sure. us disruption in sleep, but even other treatment side effects, um, you know, thinking about some people have um, dopamine of steroids that come with some of their yeah. um, treatments and is there any are there any properties or anything that would help with some sleep support yeah sleep is you know it's not a qualifying condition yeah. in the the state of arizona um sleep is something or sleep disturbances is something that come yeah. with a lot of health conditions sure um, and if you're not sleeping nothing's working right i mean that's when we're our body's producing growth hormone we're healing mm -hmm. um and sleep main things that people say across the board that improves yeah. when they start using okay. these cannabis medicines. Um, it's a little, cannabis is a little 
couple different types of cannabis we talk about at the dispensary. Mm -hmm. We talk about cannabis sativas. Okay. Um, and we talk about cannabis indicas. Okay. Cannabis sativas are typically known to be a little more on the energetic, mm -hmm. uplifting side, where the indicas are known to be a little more on that relaxing okay. type of side. Um, so if they come to the dispensary and they're having trouble type mm -hmm. strains, but cannabis is it's interesting. It's got these biphasic effects. When it first kicks in, it can actually be a little stimulating. Mm. Speeds up the mental energy, can speed up that heart rate a little bit, and actually gives people energy. I have some people with chronic fatigue and other things like that that say that's why they like cannabis mm. is cleaning their house again, they're walking their dog, they hadn't you know, done these things in, in ages. But then when it starts to wear off is when it starts to get nice and sedative. Um, and everybody's a little different mm -hmm. in how they respond to it, if they're more stimulated by it or, or more sedated by it. So if someone wants to use cannabis specifically for sleep, I typically educate them to start their test dosing a few hours before bed in the beginning, just to know how it affects okay. them. Last thing you want to do is be ready to go to sleep and, and medicate yeah. and be staring at the ceiling with the wheels turning and right. Yeah. Um, so even with those indicas, you could have some of that euphoria first and then abs come down. Absolutely. Okay. And, and everybody's a little different. If somebody's been medicating all through the day, a lot of times they've already burnt up that, that mental energy and they yeah. can medicate right at bedtime and sleep like a baby. Um, but the point is, is that um, everybody's a little different. Sure. Cannabis does have these biphasic effects and, and the individual really has to know how to, to find out the best regimen to, to get the best benefit from it. Great. Got another new question coming in. So um, we've got someone saying, you know, I don't really want to feel that feeling of euphoria. Yeah. Will the CBD give them some of those same um, treatments or effects to help relieve some of the side effects from chemo without the THC properties? Um, it can. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and some people are more sensitive to CBD products than, than others. Um, I've got many patients that say they get good relief of pain with just CBD, okay. um, with nausea, with just CBD. They say it improves their sleep. And then individuals that say, you know, it just doesn't quite get the job done, mm -hmm. the CBD alone, especially with very severe pain. Okay. Um, many of them will say, yeah, the, the CBD just doesn't quite get the job done, that it is that psychoactive part mm -hmm. of the medicine that just gives them that sense of Ah, just mm -hmm. kind of takes that, that edge off. And again, I'd like to reiterate the fact that um, many patients that are dealing with very severe pain that use THC will tell me, you know, I don't feel that, that sensation of being high. I just feel relief mm -hmm. of those symptoms. So, um, and it's real dose dependent. Um, small doses of THC cannabis typically has a nice sense of well-being, calmness, happiness. Mm -hmm. Large doses, like I said, can start that heart racing, anxiety, feel that heavy euphoria. Um, so even if someone doesn't want to feel those psychoactive effects, there may be smaller doses of, of the okay. THC that can provide them the relief they're looking for without those psychoactive concerns. Mm -hmm. If they're real sensitive to THC, then yeah, these products are available. And in fact, it's typically the patients that are very sensitive to THC mm -hmm. that tell me they do really well with just CBD alone okay. without um, having the, the higher levels of THC in the products. So it sounds like like with any other medication, you would start, you want to start with a lower dose sure. to kind of figure out where your body works and uh, what that kind of does with your body before you increase any of those dosages, especially, so it sounds like the um, amount of THC in any product might shift too. So absolutely. you can start with a lower THC product. Yeah. And dosing is very, very important as far okay. as the specific effect that they're trying to get. And I think starting with CBD dominant products mm -hmm. is a best place to okay. start if someone's never used cannabis before because yeah maybe they get the results they're looking for with just the cbd products right. and then they don't even have to worry about the the psychoactive concerns if they don't get the results they're looking for with just the cbd products mm -hmm. then they know there are some more powerful thc products that that also may may provide mm -hmm. some relief from for them so i think you know one of the other things that comes along with with cannabis which i'm sure you hear all of the time is sort of that stigma right and sort of that picture in our mind about the um, you know, lazy, you know, hanging out on the couch all day, I'm just going to eat a bunch of Cheetos, you know, whatever that might be. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how medical marijuana might look different than the, the cannabis marijuana products that we may think of sort of traditionally or even, you know, for those of 
folks in our audience that might, you know, have gone through sort of our revolutionary kind of um, very freely using marijuana products in the past, like how does that look different? Yeah, I, I think the quickest way to overcome that stigma or that perception mm -hmm. is harvest and come to one of the harvest new patients orientations. Um, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the individuals that attend those new patient orientations are over 50 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. um, people that you would expect to see in the community. They're, they're um, professionals. Mm -hmm. they're, um, it, it, it just blows that stereotype out of the water immediately. Um, and again, I think that perception is slowly changing anyways with as you know we find out more about cannabis and, and become educated on it as a medicine. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I, again, just to kind of introduce the audience, since it's been a little while since we um, introduced ourselves, my name is Tracy Thurston. I'm the program director here at Cancer Support Community, Arizona. Today we're talking with Dr. Trout. He's with Harvest Dispensaries. Um, they're headquartered here in Tempe, but he's just here to share information in general about medical marijuana and how it might be utilized with um, cancer support and care. So. Um, Gosh, let me think. Other questions that are coming in, and we welcome questions from the audience, so if you have any questions that you guys are thinking of, please share them with us so that we can make sure we cover any questions you might still have about cannabis and cancer and how it might be helpful. Um, so I think one of the other things that we often hear is, you know, if a person is, is choosing to utilize, you know, medical marijuana, what kinds of side effects might they, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about opioids, and I know, you know, the, the large implication of opioids is the dependency issues and some of those kinds of concerns, right? But even the smaller issues that come with um, opioids could impact quality of life. I'm thinking specifically about things like being constipated. Do you, do you experience that, any of that with um, medical marijuana? Is that something like, do they have those kinds of side effects other than the euphoria piece that we kind of talked like about potentially? Um, typically not, um, definitely not the constipation issues. I'm not hearing that. In fact, that's something that individuals say improve uh, oh, when they okay. start in cannabis, especially um, when they're dealing with that constipation due to opiates and, and other mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals. Um, as far as the, truly the biggest side effects that come with cannabis are the psychoactive part of it. Okay. Um, that's the, the biggest thing that patients that say that, you know, decide that this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's the reason. And now that we have these other CBD products and non-psychoactive products, it, it does allow another avenue for patients who are real sensitive to those psychoactive type of, of effects. Um, and it also different products mixed with different things because some of these um, tinctures that are oil-based, uh, I have mm -hmm. had patients uh, talk about it upsetting their stomach or feeling some you know, GI symptoms, some diarrhea and, and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, fatigue is, mm -hmm. is one of the other effects that, that people might describe with with this cannabis medicine um yeah red eyes you know yeah. The, the, yeah so if people are experiencing those side effects do you recommend coming back in and chatting again with the staff that are trained at that dispensary so that they can or do you you know i guess i get the reason for that right is because i know that i've certainly heard from some folks that you know i tried this and it just wasn't for me is it because of the specific product that they tried, do you think that there's an opportunity for them to look further? Because yeah. I think the concern for a lot of people is, you know, I feel like I'm taking a little bit of a gamble, right? So it, there's a little bit of a process to get my card. Sure. There's definitely a cost associated with that. And then there's the cost associated with the product. Um, I'm afraid it's not gonna work for me. And that seems like sort of a risk to take with a good portion of money if it's not really gonna be, you know, helpful and supportive. Do you have thoughts about that? Um, yeah, well, there are a few questions kind of in, embedded yeah. in there. That's, that's <laughs> all right. Um, um, the first of all, as far as side effects and patients or, or the staff at the dispensaries, um, obviously in a perfect world, side effects and those types of things, they should be discussing with their physician. And yeah. um, they also want to rule out that they're not experiencing those symptoms due to something totally unrelated to, okay. to the cannabis products. Um, and they can definitely ask the, the staff at the dispensaries um, whether other uh, patients are reporting, you know, similar side effects mm -hmm. with those types of products. Um, if it's a euphoria type of side effect that they don't like, then mm -hmm. um, the staff may definitely educate them about some of these other non-psychoactive type of, of products, CBD products mm -hmm. and that type of thing that can offset that. Um, or also we've seen that when CBD is taken alongside 
THC, it can actually tone down some of those side effects. So some people will um, gravitate to more of the balanced strains that are like one part CBD to one part THC, okay. or maybe two to three parts CBD to one part THC, depending on the types of sensitivities. Um, as far as whether it's going to work for that patient and, and whether they should take the gamble, as you called it, as far as the, um, the financial investment and the time investment in getting the card, um, that's really a tough one, right? They don't call it practicing medicine for, yeah. for nothing. Yeah. So sure. um, everybody's a little different, and, and they're just going to have to process that as far as um, their individual resources that they have, the types of symptoms they're dealing with, and how probable is it that they may get relief with those types of symptoms. Okay. Um, we do have another question coming Wonderful. in. So what is RSO oil and can that cure cancer? I knew this one was, was coming. <laughs> um, yeah, Rick Simpson oil is what RSO stands for. And you cannot get on the internet and research cannabis and cancer without coming across Rick Simpson and Rick Simpson oil. Okay. Um, so the question, can cannabis cure uh, cancer? Um, we need to be real careful with this one just because we don't have the research in humans to um, fully answer that question. Yeah. Uh, one thing, we've actually known that cannabis kills cancer cells um, in vitro in a petri dish mm. since the 70s. Okay. And we're getting a lot of wonderful new research that's coming out, um, especially countries like Spain and Italy, uh, uh, Israel are doing some wonderful research on cancer. Um, Great Britain is doing well and at this point we can say that these cannabinoids absolutely have anti-cancer properties to them um, there's no doubt about it we've seen them again like i said kill cancer cells shrink tumors and mm -hmm. um, petri dishes mice rats animal studies but like i said we have no studies in humans mm -hmm. that show that cannabis cures cancer so yeah. um, we really need to get this rescheduled on the, on the federal level to clear some of those hurdles to do the research just so we can find out how effective may it be yeah. Um, and again, there's a lot of stories on the internet saying I, you know, cured my cancer mm -hmm. with, with cannabis, and I think we need to take those with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. um, what they are stories on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, some of them look quite impressive, but uh, as a physician, I believe in evidence-based medicine, so until sure. we have placebo-controlled studies to find out how effective may or may not it be, mm -hmm. is it more effective with certain cancers than others, what type of dosing does it take, that mm -hmm. type of, of thing. So, um, yeah, Rick Simpson was, the, like I said, the first guy that popularized belief that you could cure cancer with cannabis. Mm -hmm. He had a type of melanoma, skin cancer, it had spread, and he re it reportedly, he had uh, put it into remission or, or cured it, so to speak, uh, with concentrated cannabis oils. Um, like I said, uh, we've got a lot of research yeah. to, to tease that out. I did see the first human trials with cannabis oil and cancer um, reported just this last year, mm -hmm. and it did come out of the, the United Kingdom, out of uh, uh, GW Pharmaceuticals, and what they, a they, uh, small study with a group of patients dealing with glioblastoma, brain cancer, mm -hmm. and what they're finding out is that cannabis actually synergizes well with the chemotherapy treatments, mm -hmm. and half the patients just received the chemotherapy, and half the patients received chemotherapy and cannabis extracts, um, a one-to-one -one THC and, and CBD together. Mm -hmm. And what they saw is the patients that received the cannabis along with the chemotherapy were living longer. Mm. Um, and also, again, we know that cannabis is very good at helping to palliate the, the symptoms that they're sure. dealing with. So it's looking like, um, again, cannabis is a, definitely a very good medicine to help palliate those symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if it can have those anti-cancer effects, wonderful. Um, but like I said, we got a lot of research to tease out how effective, you know, may or may not cannabis be for, for actually treating um, cancer. But that's where the studies are headed, Great. is junked to conventional treatments for um, yeah. treating cancers. And, and hopefully at some point we'll start looking at some standalone um, treatments with, with cannabis and cancer to see how effective it may or may not be. So I have another question. But before I get there, just kind of as a follow-up to what you were sharing. So I know one of the challenges is trying to find, you know, obviously there are going to be stories on the internet about all sorts of things that could sure. cure cancer, but we don't, we want to look at valid studies. Is there any one kind of 
term that you would suggest that people could, if they wanted to delve into it a little bit more and kind of read a little of that research specifically for cannabis and cancer? Like, is there a place that they could go or is that tricky still to um, kind of navigate? Yeah, it's now we're before there was of, of any information about these research articles yeah. and that type of thing. And now you get on the Internet and you're just flooded with yeah. all these different people that are giving their opinion of sure. of what the research is. So uh, that's that's a little tough. There are some good review articles that are um, that are being published mm -hmm. now, but much of that is quite scientific and okay. um, a little t a little daunting for just the average person to kind of read sure. through. Pretty boring to <laughs> probably put most people to sleep. So um, again, that's another thing we do at our new patient orientation is try to, um, again, I spend a lot of time reading that literature and try to mm -hmm. break it down and, and, and make it uh, more understandable and, and mm -hmm. a little easier for, for people to get access to it. So um, the new patient orientations are a wonderful place to come and ask questions okay. about that. And like I said, there's a ton of that that's out yeah. there if you just plug it in, but um, there's stories on the internet, right? Yeah. So you gotta, right. you gotta right. through quite a bit of it. Okay. So one of our next questions is, are hemp-derived CBD oils as effective as the cannabis-derived or effective at all? Great question. Um, so terminology, um, cannabis, you hear me using that word quite mm -hmm. often. That is the botanically accepted name for this plant, cannabis. Uh, marijuana is a common term that mm -hmm. kind of came about in the early 1900s here in the United States, um, more so for the purposes of, of prohibition. Mm -hmm. Um, hemp, another common term for this cannabis plant. It's mm -hmm. been used for, um, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, as far as now we use that term hemp, though, more for the industrial uses mm -hmm. of the plant. So the um, fiber, clothing, fuel, the seed oil that doesn't have any cannabinoids in it, right. um, nutrition, those types of things. But we're also seeing products coming to the shelf mm -hmm. being called hemp extracts. And those are typically these CBD type of products or um, the non-psychoactive mm -hmm. type of medicine. So if it says hemp, that's one thing that should be true about it is that it should have very low amounts of the THC um, okay. and, and low amount potential for that, that psychoactive effect. The industry is starting to land on this 0.3% number, so less than 0.3% THC, and they can call it hemp. Um, but again, it's all cannabis. It all comes from the, the cannabis plant. Okay. Now, of these CBD products, though, um, we're seeing a lot of different... And just because something called, is called hemp oil, you got to read a little deeper. Like, mm -hmm. I said, you can get a bottle of hemp oil that's big from the grocery store mm -hmm. for like eight bucks, mm -hmm. and that was pressed from the seed. So no cannabinoids, no CBD. Still very medicinal, though. Um, loaded with your omega fatty acids, omega-3s, mm -hmm. 6s, and 9s. Um, very anti-inflammatory. Um, the seed itself is loaded with uh, essential amino acids, the essential proteins mm -hmm. to, to sustain life. Uh, so the, the, seed, the seed is very nutritious, but doesn't have the cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. So just because something's called hemp, you've got to read a little deeper into it got to it. find out exactly what it is. Um, as far as CBD products specifically, a great variety of those as well. We see these that are called CBD isolates, mm -hmm. meaning they've isolated the CBD away from the THC as well as probably all the other cannabinoids and mm -hmm. terpenoids, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's losing a lot of that whole plant characteristic sure. to it. Um, and then we've got these hemp extracts, which um, should be more of a whole plant type of medicine, but should still be below that 0.3% okay. THC if they're calling it hemp. Um, so I myself uh, like whole plant medicines. Mm -hmm. Again, I want traces of all of those cannabinoids mm -hmm. and terpenoids in there. So um, I do lean towards these, um, again, hemp extracts rather than a uh, CBD isolate. Mm -hmm. And just because the hemp extract, it may still be a CBD isolate that they mm -hmm. isolated from hemp and then pure down. So like I said, you've got to ask a little, a few more questions when you start seeing um, something called hemp. Um, if it's a cannabis extract specific, um, chances are it has more THC than that 3%. Okay. So either way, you need to ask questions about what are the constituents mm -hmm. in this, um, this medicine. Uh, and I do, again, I like those whole plant medicines, but it depends on what you're trying to, to get out of it. Yeah. Um, if you're just looking for uh, those CBD effects, the antioxidant, inflammatory, the neuroprotective type, type of effects. Um, like I said, I still like the whole plant medicines, but maybe you look at for like a 20 to one, mm -hmm. 20 parts CBD to one part 
C. Mm -hmm. um, the Charlotte's Web type products, those are testing more into the, the 40 to 1, mm -hmm. uh, 40 to 50 to 1 parts CBD to 1 part THC, but still a whole plant type of, of extraction or product. So mm -hmm. I think that's the thing you need to look at more than just the name, whether it's called a hemp mm -hmm. um, extract or a cannabis extract. You really need to dive in there and find out um, what, are, what are the constituents in, in this medicine. Wow, lots to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, next question we have, will cannabis interfere with chemotherapy? Um, and obviously we have a lot of research to do on this mm -hmm. topic. Uh, patients have been using cannabis during chemotherapy for a long time mm -hmm. as far as for the anti-nausea effects. And I'm not seeing a whole bunch of concern about that. Um, in fact, it is starting to look like that cannabis synergizes well with chemotherapy treatments. Um, I think the one concern might be with um, anti-cancer agents that are the immune system and okay. the immune system to attack the cancer. Yes, like the um, immunotherapies. The immunotherapies, thank you. There may be some concern that um, cannabis may dampen down mm -hmm. that immunotherapy effect. So we need to take a... a much better look at, yeah. at that and if that is truly um, a concern. But I think that um, based on chemotherapy versus immunotherapy, I think that's where we need to take, um, take more sure. concern. Yeah. So it sounds like if you're thinking about or considering this as an option, you need to check back with your, even if Absolutely. the oncologist doesn't, isn't the expert in cannabis, they're gonna know potentially whether or not there's a kind of an interference potential. There. Potentially, yeah. Okay. Um, they should. Yeah. At this point, they should be doing yeah. their homework on cannabis because even if they don't believe in cannabis, um, if they're working in oncology in one of these states that have medical cannabis, many of their patients are using right. it. So, yeah, and, and like I was saying, it's a tough one because there there is still a bit of a bias with with cannabis. Um, I th we're seeing that fall though. More and more uh, conventional physicians are are opening up to it mm -hmm. because of the reports their patients are bringing to them mm -hmm. about the um, the relief that they're getting with this medicine. Um, and in, in a perfect world, you should be able to share anything with your physician. And what I tell my patients is, if you don't feel like you can have that discussion with your physician, maybe you need a new physician. Mm -hmm. um, again, whether they agree with it or not, I, I still feel you should be able to tell your physician everything that you're doing and have that um, trusted, confident relationship with them. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. So our next question, how does a patient know that they're getting from the dispensary what's being advertised? Yeah, and that's another uh, concern. The, the program isn't regulated to the standpoint where you don't have to, the dispensaries do not have to test those products, but mm. third party testing is the gold standard. Okay. Um, in the nutritional world as well, like even your supplements that you buy at, mm. at the health food store um, aren't necessarily regulated to, to that level. So if you can get third party testing that shows that um, it has in it what, what's being advertised, that's the gold standard for that. And so is that a regular part of a practice for Yeah, many a of the of the the good dispensaries test their products, harvest test their products very well. Okay. Um, so so they know what they're they're supplying sure. patients with. Yeah. Um, what about the entourage effect? What the entourage that? effect. And that goes back to when we were talking about this whole plant mm -hmm. medicine. It's the synergy between all of those components working together. Like I said, the THC, the C B D, all those cannabinoids, the terpenoids. So it's THC and the entourage of, of all the other um, components in that plant. And we believe, again, that these whole plant medicines have uh, a greater effect together than the sum of the individual parts. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Um, we have another question. So, oh gosh, cannabis makes me hungry all the time. Like food yeah. cravings can yeah. be so intense. How do I work that out if I'm also trying to watch my diet and, and knowing yeah. that that can be a real struggle for many cancer patients, right? Yeah, this is a very common question that we get. And that's one of the things that cannabis is known for, is helping to stimulate appetite, mm -hmm. which um, many people that are dealing with chemotherapy that just really wreaks havoc on the taste buds and the appetite can be very helpful with, or um, um, individuals that are starting to waste and can't keep weight on. That's one of the things that they, they look mm -hmm. to cannabis for. Um, and I get this question all the time. Patients come in, new patients saying, you know, I'm already overweight. I hear this stuff gives you the munchies. I don't need to gain weight. And, yeah. you know, what, which products do you recommend? And the truth of the matter is studies have shown that regular cannabis users 
actually have much better body weights than those who don't use cannabis, uh, better blood sugars as well. Um, what we see is that munchy phenomenon is typically more with, with new mm -hmm. people that are new to cannabis, mm -hmm. or if they just got a, a particularly high dose in, in their system, it may stimulate that. Um, if patients are concerned about that, what I'll t typically educate them to do is clear the junk food out of the house, you know, clear out the chips and, you know, all that type of munchy stuff mm -hmm. and sit out the broccoli and the carrots and the, you know, the good mm -hmm. healthy dips and that mm -hmm. type of thing. If you're going to munch, at least munch on things that, that are healthy for you. Um, but like I said, typically with regular cannabis users, mm -hmm. we don't see that as an issue. Um, which brings up another good point, too, that I, I don't think I brought up earlier is that people also build a tolerance to the impact that comes with the THC or that euphoria. Mm -hmm. um, new users are a lot more affected by it than somebody who is mm. a regular user of, of cannabis. So um, yeah, typically that, that munchy thing isn't a, a huge problem for um, regular cannabis sure. users. So it sounds like maybe some of the things that people are concerned about or are maybe newer to cannabis have some side effects about they might dissipate with more regular use Correct. of it because they're thinking about maybe, oh, I just started this, try this, I'm always hungry or I'm really euphoric. Maybe that'll dissipate over the course yeah, of use. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then when people learn to, um, to get that dosage right for the right time, mm -hmm. right environment for the symptoms that they're looking for as well. Yeah. So I just want to check back in with everybody and kind of do a reminder who we are, what we're doing today. So my name is Tracy Thurston. I am the Senior Director of Program and Growth here at Cancer Support Community Arizona. I'm here with Dr. Trout. Dr. Trout is with Harvest Dispensaries. Is there a particular office that you like, are you at the kind of the Tempe office? Do you kind of float around? I float around to all okay. the, the dispensaries. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Sounds and good. then, like I said, we do have the um, specific times where we'll do the new patient orientation. So right. if patients are wanting to come out and chat with me specifically, they can contact the dispensary and, and yeah. find out where my on-site hours are. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we have, it looks like just a couple of minutes. We're about to wrap up. I know we had a little bit of technical difficulty, um, but we're going to do maybe just uh, five more minutes because we did have that gap. Um, so if you have one last burning question, please send it in now so we can make sure that we answer. So just a couple highlights, I guess, that I've heard throughout the course of our talk is there are a lot of different, um, you know, properties and um, uses for cannabis and that there are many things, you know, we look at the whole plant and that's really important to look at because there seems to be, I think, what they call the entourage yeah, that, that kind of goes with it, synergy, right? Synergy, the entourage effect, absolutely. So something to be mindful of and when you're looking at different products, there might be, you know, just some isolated products and so you might want to take a look at, you know, is this going to be the right match for me based on some of my concerns or needs or those kinds of things. And also, you know, maybe checking in with your physician is always important, your oncologist, your primary care doctor, make sure that they're in the loop with what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, questions you might have. Yeah, and there's also a couple of good naturopaths in the Valley. Um, there's a few, actually. A um, couple I have in mind, though, that um, specifically um, specialize in alternative cancer therapies or naturopathic cancer therapies. Correct. And yeah. I think they're wonderful individuals to have as part of your team, yeah. just to again, help you understand the, the nutrition aspect, any other supplements mm -hmm. that might be available or, or alternative treatments. And they're also a little more dialed into the cannabis medicines mm -hmm. and a, a little more approachable about that and how to use them as well. So um, yeah, I would always recommend if, if someone has the resources to bring one of those individuals on as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and many of those folks come here and speak as well because of yes. their expertise. Yes. Um, it looks like we have a potential question coming in. Um, oh, this is a great one. Can a person travel with cannabis? Yeah, and obviously that's more of a legal question, so don't hold me accountable on it, but, uh, but I'll take a little stab here. Um, in the state of Arizona, if a person gets their certification and the card from the health department, they've got a qualified immunity to use mm -hmm. cannabis in the state of Arizona. Okay. Um, again, still a Schedule 1 on a federal level. I think we're getting ready to have that dialogue and, and look at that regulation on a federal level, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. So if someone does cross the, the state line, they are crossing a federal border and they need to take that into consideration. Um, now, different states, some of them do have reciprocal programs mm -hmm. where they will recognize the card from Arizona. Uh, and that's where someone needs to do their research ahead of time, you know, where they're traveling. Um, uh, I, I, what I typically tell my patients is always err on the side of caution. The last thing you want to do is increase the stress of a medical situation with the stress of a legal 
situation. Yeah. Um, but again, as far as that card is concerned, it get, provides them a legal immunity in the state of Arizona. Okay. So be careful. Be careful. <laughs> Ab absolutely. <laughs> Even yeah. when going to other states, that might also Absolutely. Have Understand the laws in the states you're, you're going to. Um, and again, when you cross that state line, you're crossing a federal border. Keep that in mind. Sounds good. Um, any other last questions we have from our audience? We have about two minutes, so I think we have time for maybe one quick question, but otherwise I think we're gonna go ahead and try to wrap it up here. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, always a great topic, always a lot of questions about kind of the process. Um, so again, in the state of Arizona, you do need a medical uh, marijuana card. Um, you can get that through, you know, you need to have a qualifying condition. Obviously cancer is a qualifying condition for that. Um, could be utilized in a lot of different ways, but it sounds like pain and nausea are some big side effects that it really could help potentially support, help improve. Um, there might be some side effects associated with it, so always good to kind of, you know, listen to your body and then go back to your physician and also go back to maybe some of the experts that we have at the dispensaries who could potentially steer them in a certain direction because it sounds like there's quite a variety of, of you know, dosages and, and yeah. combinations and things like that. And the main thing is just be conservative. Be conservative with, when you're, with your dosing when you start out in the beginning. Yeah. Um, keep track of the milligrams of THC because that's the part that has the the psychoactive mm -hmm. side effects mm -hmm. that, that, you know, for some people could, can be a little too much. And I think keeping a journal is a really mm -hmm. good idea when you start using this medicine. Um, you know, this is what I'm using, this is when I took it, this is what I started to feel, to really quantify those effects and it'll help that, that individual dial it in for, for yeah. them in the future. They can also take those journal um, pages or that information and provide it to their primary care physician or the physician that they're working with to, to show them the, the effects that they're getting with this medicine as well. Great. All right, we have one last question for Perfect. today. Do children or can children use cannabis? Um, absolutely. Um, in fact, we serve many families that are using this medicine for pediatric seizure mm -hmm. disorders. Um, cannabis, um, the CBD medicine specifically, have been shown to, to work very well with certain conditions of the nervous system, especially seizure disorders to help balance out the electrical activity in the brain. Um, we've had children as young as weeks mm -hmm. old um, you know, all the way up to adulthood, mm -hmm. obviously using it for, for those concerns and other concerns as well. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the safety profile of cannabis is very, very good. Um, it is a very safe medicine from a toxicity mm -hmm. perspective. So um, with that being said, I think it's a perfect medicine for, for children dealing with those things. Um, obviously, you want to be very, very conservative mm -hmm. and, and be very mindful of the psychoactive potential of it. But yeah, lots of children use, using this medicine okay. with great results. Great. Well, thank you so much. It looks like we are just at our time. So um, again, Dr. Trout, thank